Uh, Babette, you all set? I am ready. And I'm, I'm gonna start right off by jumping on some things that Lenny said, so I'm really ready to go. All right, excellent. Well, let me just quickly introduce Babette for those of you that don't know her. Many of you have heard from her before. It is always a pleasure to welcome back Babette Baker to our community. Babette is an affiliate consultant at Support Center and Principal at Paydia PM, which she launched in 2013. Ms. Baker has over 30 years of experience supporting nonprofits, businesses, and municipalities in program design and development, process facilitation, grants administration, fiscal management, marketing, and program assessment evaluation as a consultant and nonprofit professional. Is there anything she can't do? She has also held roles from coordinator to executive director in nonprofit agencies, municipalities, and community based organizations across the country. Thank you, Babette. We need our volunteers. They're the foundation of all of the wonderful organizations that are represented here today. So I will turn it over to you and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. And I will say that I always miss being in the room with folks very much. Um, so I think this is my third or fourth time presenting for you guys, Melissa. So I don't know when you're gonna get tired of me, but okay. And we'll figure it out. Um, so I'm just gonna add a little bit more to my bio real quick. So I, I just counted and I'm like now up to like over 35 years, which is really scary. Um, and what I can tell you is that I started off as a grant writer in the field. Um, and what I always heard from organizations was, you know, we need money, we need money, we need money. Can you write us a grant? And then often when I got into writing grants for people as I realized, and you know, we didn't have those words when I started in this field, but we often, there was often issues with organizational capacity, misalignment of resources and some operational inefficiencies. And, and I, so I, I moved into moving away from grant writing more into program design and evaluation. Cause I realized even if an organization gets the money, um, you know, are they using it effectively? So. Um, the tagline of Padilla actually is identify, execute, and measure, which means we help you identify issues and opportunities. We help you um, execute a plan, and then we help you measure the impact. And so recently, I've started moving into some healthcare consulting, which I've been enjoying very much. So um, I want to jump um, on to some things that Lenny um, provided in her presentation. Did anybody catch all the data that Lenny provided in her data in her presentation to you guys? And I, I am a firm believer in raising your hands, putting stuff in the chat. Um, Melissa has to help me because because it's been over 35 years. So I, it's hard to multitask as much as I used to when I was younger. <laughs> but you know, I was listening to Lenny and I was thinking to myself, she was talking about the needs in your community, who was kind of calling in. And I thought, you know, I hope you guys are really listening to that because as we're going, continuing to go through this pandemic, you know, what kind of information can like the 211 provide for you guys as you guys are looking at, you know, is the work you still do relevant? You know, where you might find volunteers? How are you assessing the needs in your own community? How can you use this information in grant applications? So I want you guys to make sure that, and Lenny, I don't know if, if, if you guys provide any kind of like um, annual updates or quarterly updates or anything about the, the information that comes into 211. And I know no personal information, but some of the aggregate data on the type of needs that you're seeing. And if, you, if you're not doing that, I would encourage you guys to do so. We can, we definitely can provide that. I, I will say this uh, because of uh, this COVID with all the calls handling there, you know, there was a delay in providing information, but uh, we are back into providing weekly updates to Melissa. She has it, but if any organization looking for what's happening in your community, like uh, why people are calling, don't hesitate, please ask. Great. So Melissa, you're, 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 who's manning my presentation? I am. Hi, Emily. Okay. Can we put up the poll? Sure. Okay. And I'm going to go to full view because I don't need to see it. Oh, I do want to see the chat though. Okay. So if you guys can um, answer this poll, what is the role? Um, what is your role in the organization? And then the second question, um, are you solely responsible for um, managing volunteers? Okay. 
So come on, I want all of you to jump into this. We have 138 people on the call and I'm only seeing about 87 people. There we go. All right, 37 more of you, come on. There we go, it's moving up, thank you. I always like to kind of know who's in the room so I can make sure that I um, touch on the things that people are kind of looking for and things that people people need. A lot of management, okay, some board members, okay. All right, Emily, I don't think we're gonna get, oh, no. All right, we're gonna give you guys another like 30 seconds. Okay. Yes, Mary Ellen, yes, we often do wear many hats, including cleaning the bathrooms if we have to, been there, done that. <laughs> That's right, watering the plants, doing the dishes, <laughs> full service, non-profiting. There you go, there you go. Okay, cool. And poll? Yeah, let's end the poll. Yeah. All right, so 64% of you are in management, 25% uh, of you frontline, and 78% of you are not solely responsible for managing volunteers. Interesting. So, Emily, thank you. Can we take that down? And while you're taking that down, I just want to say, is Emily, I'm sorry, is Ellie from the Culinary Institute of America still on the call? No, no, she's still on the call. Yes, I'm still here. Okay, so my son, my oldest son went to Marist and my youngest son was accepted at the CIA, but decided to go to Paul Smith's. <laughs> so I was disappointed, but the Adirondacks are very beautiful. So I'm very happy. <laughs> Emily, can we take this down, please, ma'am? Get back to the. Do I have control, Emily? Nope, I do. But oh, are okay. you on the screen? I'm sorry. Are you not seeing your PowerPoint? But I'm, I'm still seeing the. Oh, I'm still seeing the poll. Oh, oh, let me see. oh, but I had to clip it out myself. This is why you need your grandchildren to come over and be your tech consultants because. That's what they do. So um, ancient map makers or cartographers used to use phrase like here there be because you know they didn't know what was on the other side of things. And so I've been thinking a lot about this as we've gone into the pandemic and we're, you know, we're about 10 months in, thinking about do we know what's on the other side of this, right? And so they would write things like here there be sea serpents, here there be monsters, here there be tigers, which is actually also a very famous Stephen King short story. Um, and so although we've known, you know, we personally as this generation has never been, been through a pandemic like this, we've gone through natural disasters and economic downturns. Um, but COVID has caused such disruption in such a short amount of time. And I don't know about any of you, but I, I kind of thought, okay, a few months in, we'll wear our masks, this thing is gonna go away. And to hear that like four new strains have popped up in the last couple of weeks and you know, we're not sure if the vaccine is going to be effective against us. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but what I what I want us to think about, um, and as your board, as you, um, I can't remember his name right now, but you know, the board chair of United Way said at the beginning of this, you know, we're going to probably be living in this virtual world at least until the end of the year, if not a little bit into 2022. So um, what does that look like for us as we think about how do we engage volunteers and do things new, but some things never change. So Emily, can we go to the next slide? So for those of you um, who have been to my presentations in the past, you know I am a huge proponent of planning. Um, I'm a certified life cycles, nonprofit life cycles um, consultant. And if you haven't heard of that, Dr. Susan Kenny Stevens um, created this um, methodology about working with nonprofits called nonprofit life cycles. And I'll make sure that um, when you guys get a, a copy of this presentation, which is gonna be very different from what you see right now because I have written so many notes and have made so many pivots in this presentation, which I normally do. And I also try to you know, keep track of the chats and everything um, because um, 
I want to make sure I address people's issues and questions and concerns, though. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Susan Kenny Stevens talks about is building your capacity. And you build your capacity by planning around these four table legs. So management is how you run, um, how you run your programs. Um, your governance, of course, is your board. Your business model is this type of services and products that you deliver. And your administrative systems are kind of like those backline, um, back office things that you guys do. So, you know, how strong are your databases? How strong is your accounting system? You know, how are you tracking those kind of things? Those four table legs support your programs. And of course, your programs support your mission. And so, you know, by building a culture of, of planning, not that you can... Um, identify everything that's gonna happen in your organization. But if you have that capacity in place, you're more likely to be resilient enough to survive the things that you go through. So I really encourage you guys to really think about your capacity and your resiliency. And I also encourage organizations to think about their capacity in terms of if you want to implement a program or if you wanna do something, like for instance, if you want to do a, a mass mailing to like 20,000, 30,000 people in your community, but you, you're an organization of three staff people, how likely is that, that that's gonna work for you if you don't have the capacity to do that? So when you're thinking about your programming and you're thinking about your services and you think about the things that you do, think about what is our capacity to, to implement, to, um, and to measure our impact around the things that we're doing. So always think that about that in the back of your head, okay? And please, I love the chat. Raise your hand for questions. I think Emily and Melissa are kind of helping me monitor all of that. Any questions about um, capacity equals resiliency? And the other thing that you guys should know about me is that I always believe that the best learning is in the room. Um, peer learning is so powerful. You guys are actually on the ground doing this stuff every day, day in and day out. So please make sure that you're also sharing information with each other because that's really important. So can we go to the next slide, Emily? Did I ask you guys to do this as a poll or no? Okay, so don't worry. So I just want you to think about, you can put it in the chat. Um, what, or what has your organization done in response to volunteer management during the last couple of months? So I, I did a similar presentation for you guys at the um, back in, I think it was March or May. Um, Melissa, um, and we talked about things like, you know, having a volunteer plan, um, you know, making sure that you looked at your insurance and you looked at if you were going to have to provide PPE for people. And so what kind of things have, have people done um, in response to this in the last couple of months? And I would love to, if anybody wants to like pipe in, take themselves off mute, raise their hands and say a few things, I would love to do that right now and really interact with you guys. Okay, don't make me talk for 45 minutes by myself. Please don't. <laughs> so Jacqueline raised her hand. Yes, and I see Mary Ellen as well. So can we go to Jacqueline first and then Mary Ellen? I think it was Jacqueline Hernandez. Yes, are we speaking or are we chatting? We are chatting. We're having a dialogue, every kind of okay. conversation. All right. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure not to violate the rules. <laughs> um, no rules. Okay. All right. I love it. Um, so, so with regards to our, our um, organization is purely volunteer. Mm -hmm. And so um, our biggest challenge has always been obviously to maintain the volunteer status so that hundred percent of the, the money that we raise at this time goes to the needs of the, the, the youth that we service in our community. Mm -hmm. So because of that, um, we have not had the challenge of the financials. Um, but, you know, the financials as far as employees, but with regards to volunteers, because there was so many limitations in what we were able to do in groups um, with the youth that we, um, our mission with our youth is to provide them with a um, space for socialization. So okay. COVID is the, you know, the, the opposite, the total opposite. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to meet the needs of our population we had to be very creative about how we were able to um, meet safely with the youth. And of course, with the schools being on hybrid and some being totally remote, the mental health of our youth was challenged even more. 
So, um, so what we did was, is we creatively looked for outdoor space to be able to meet with them. Um, we did a lot more of that. Um, and then our volunteers were really based on what we were doing. So if we did a community event, we might have been able to enlist parents or people in the community that were interested in the event, but we did a lot more outreach, community outreach, and we didn't stay indoors. It was more outdoors. Um, kids were packaging in their homes. We did um, for the first responders, but we were focused on how do we meet, get them active, get them emotionally and mentally engaged without being a, you know, without being a burden. So the volunteers were really the kids. It was, you know, them volunteering to do something. And it was um, people in the community that got rotated into specific projects they were interested in. Perfect, thank you. And um, what's the age group in the upper room? So we're 13 to 18 years. We do have alumni who then are, what we do is we recycle our teens. So once they are, uh, graduate and they go to college, we, we create an alumni. So we have a whole graduation. Um, <clears throat> we have a, <clears throat> a ceremonial passing the torch um, mm -hmm. where they go from member to now leader. And so that has also been very helpful in maintaining a volunteer base because we basically say, we poured into you, now it's time for you to pour into other youth. So they are typically the leaders and because they're so close in age, it's great because they relate to the youth, they understand, they become like an older mentor to the, to the kids. Thank so you. that's another way that we've been able to keep our volunteers involved. Perfect, thank you. And I don't know, for those of you, I want you guys to pay close attention to once again, because the best learning is in the room, that is such a brilliant retention model, right? Because most organizations say they have an issue with retention. So I think the other person was Mary Ellen. I should be writing these down. She had a question, she had her hand raised as well. Good memory. Hello, I'm Mary Ellen. <laughs> Mary Ellen. Um, so at the Artifact, we focus on uh, the arts as a pathway for student empowerment and college and career development. Um, specifically in terms of volunteers, our biggest challenge was helping get supplies and technology out to our students so that they could kind of pivot with us and continue their learning virtually. Um, and uh, we made use of volunteers in helping us to bag up supplies. Uh, we made use of volunteers in helping us to sort of conduct outreach uh, to who needed a computer at home to be able to continue their learning. Um, and then also to do some of the deliveries and drop-offs while wearing PPE, of course. Um, but maybe the biggest change caused by COVID in terms of volunteer management was we had to redesign what being an intern looked like. We had a lot of young people who would come into the office um, getting college credit and then being assistant teachers or um, you know, helping to maintain supplies and equipment, just helping things around the office. And all of a sudden, all of their work had to become things that could be conducted virtually. So um, in a way it became less hands-on, but we wanted it to still be as meaningful an experience as possible, while also contributing to the well-being of our students. So we began to make more use of interns to um, pair up virtually with students and sort of just have human conversation time. You know, how's it going? what's hard for you? Um, do you have any questions about getting into college or what it's like to be a college student? Which many of them did because, you know, the idea of what it means to prepare for college also has changed radically in the last six months. And we've had to have a lot of, you know, really emotionally hard conversations with students who are realizing maybe it's in my best interests to postpone trying to apply to college for a year. Do I really want to pay $30,000 to sit in my living room? Um, or go $30,000 into debt to sit in my living room, which, you know, it always, it's so hard for adults also because we value education so much, but at the same time, uh, we have no idea what we would have done if we were 18 years old and in that decision-making position, you know, what would have seemed like it made sense or not. So um, there's been a lot to figure out and a lot that we still haven't figured out, but our volunteers have helped us uh, sort of just be in it together with our students, which has meant a lot. So it's a lot less of that dishwashing and plant watering for interns and a lot more of individual virtual mentorship. Thank you. So you know what's really interesting um, is 
we do really value education. And so, of course, I'm, I'm older, so all of my children are gone, thank goodness. Uh, but, you know, I think for parents who are planning to have their children out of the house, they're kind of like, well, we're glad you're here, but, hmm. <laughs> So it's very interesting. So I'm, I'm glad in your, your, so the kids are thinking about this, the parents are thinking about this, and you guys have made these pivots to figure out like, how do we still continue to support, you know, the students that we, we need to support in this new, new world. And one of the, the statistics I had in my presentation for later on, but I'll give it now, is that they're saying about, they're roughly estimating that 30% of people in the US right now are suffering some kind of anxiety and or depression, right? And because what they thought their lives would be are not where they think they would have been right now. And so for all of you who are you know, doing this work, you're, you're seeing it probably not only with your clients, but even with your staff and in your own families. So, so I think some of the things that we hopefully that we will talk about today, you can apply both to staff and your own personal lives because we know we're gonna be talking a lot about, about connection and things like that. So, you know, as your organization um, has made these pivots in the, in the past year, um, how have you guys kind of communicated this both internally to your staff and your board and then externally? So have you been doing more regular updates on your websites, doing more social media posts, um, more newsletters, um, that kind of thing? And you guys can either raise your hands or put in the chat. Um, I don't, I don't have the raise your hand. Thing. Okay. Um, okay. I don't see your face. So, and what's your first name? Curtis Simpson from, um, you okay. I have, uh, probably a very old computer. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think for us, we kind of started looking at the numbers earlier and got in front of it. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was like, we were talking about this virtually like in October, you know, we were telling, cause we have um, <clears throat> a good articulation agreement with Vassar, you know, and a lot of their students wanted to intern and volunteer, you know, um, because some of their classes were canceled. So they were here. So a lot of them were like, well, what are we going to do? So what we did was we kind of looked at, okay, so what do you like to do? And some of it was, okay, so we had an art student <clears throat> or someone that wanted to volunteer and their class canceled. We had two art students um, volunteer with us. And what they did was they did a mural with the kids. And then what we did for them was we told them that you could, they could use that as their portfolio. And we told them like, you know, we might be going remote going in January. So let us know what you wanted to do this way that they was able to fix their schedules up and not believe that they were gonna come right back. You know, so we got in front of it you know, we send a lot of emails. Um, I think social media at this point is like one of the best ways to get in contact with especially volunteers and interns because that's it right now. That's really the lifeline for everything right now. Curtis, what's the name of your organization? Youth Services. It's a, I work for Family Services in Poughkeepsie. Okay. Okay. And you guys want to share about how they've been communicating with both staff and community? I Hi, Ken. This is Sarah Ugolini from the Red Hook Community Center. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, so to kind of answer both your questions, we went, you know, we went hybrid, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have programming in person and virtually. Um, so that required us to, one, keep our in-person in -person space very safe. So we've, you know, lots of with PPE, yeah, obviously, and we've gone way of kind of, um, it also, ex it, it required us to really up our virtual game. Um, so we took. I think Sarah froze up on us. I'm going to give her like another second, see if she can unfreeze. Okay. This time okay. to create. Sarah, you keep freezing on us. Sarah, I'm going to ask you to put your stuff in the chat because um, you keep freezing on us. 
So I'm looking at create a new website. Okay. Sarah, I'm going to ask you to put your stuff in the chat because you keep freezing. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so, so what, what, what's, um, so Andrea says they pivoted to virtual programming and they communicate with their wonderful volunteers, high school and college students. Okay, great, great. So um, this is a quick plug because I'm a grant writer, which I don't really do anymore. But I would suggest to all of you who had to make some quick exits out of your organizations, and do this all this home based work. Don't be afraid to go to some of your local funders like your banks and credit unions and businesses. And if you need to update your technology, please ask for that. And I don't know who your um, your internet provider is in the area. I know up here, I'm in upstate New York. It's um, Spectrum, um, but they do have some grants um, that come. I think I want to say, I think maybe summer. Um, around technology. So keep an eye out for that, but don't be afraid to ask people for that because we're gonna be in this world for a little bit longer. And if you need to update your technology as an organization, please do so. All right, I'm gonna skip this last question because I think we'll just, if you wanna answer, just put it in the chat. Can we go to the next slide, Emily? So why do people volunteer? And I, I pulled this from Volunteer Pro. Um, and so people volunteer for lots of reasons, right? They, they volunteer because it aligns with their values. They see it as a way of building their skills, building, building these social connections and that kind of thing. Um, and what I will say to you is that 42% of people who volunteer, volunteer because they seek your organization out. And 25% um, volunteer because they are approached by your organization. Those are usually like your board and committee members and, and things like that. So I want you guys to think about all the people who work the polls during elections, you know, who canvass for signatures, you know, all the folks who, um, who got involved in peaceful protest um, this, this, you know, this last year, those folks all volunteered around things that, that were important to them around their passion. You know, so if you have folks who have, um, you know, like Black Lives Matter signs in their yard, or they have signs in their yard around, um, you know, slow down children in, in this area, they are actually identifying to you guys as organizations, the things that they care about. So pay attention to stuff like that, because those are folks, you, you know, you want to be thinking about, hmm, you know, every, I see, you know, Betty Jones on, on Oak Street always has these signs in her yards about different things. You know, she might be a great person to connect with and volunteer. So, you know, who, who are we involved with internally in our organization that may already be connected to like that, the Betty Joneses, okay? So right now we are estimating about 12.6 million. Thank you, crazy cat lady. I am too a crazy cat lady and I'm surprised they're actually not all over my desk right now. Um, you know, currently there are about 12.6 million people um, who are unemployed in, in America. Um, some of those folks are still actively looking for jobs. Um, some of them are close to retirement and they're just kind of like, well, you know what? I might as well just do early retirement and go out now. Um, and some of them are thinking, you know what? I'm going to wait a little while longer before I really start looking again to see what things are going to kind of happen in my community. And so that is a great potential volunteer base, because let's just be clear, we are all a little tired of being at home right about now, just doing our day-to-day our -day kind of things. And, and a lot of us are on Zoom and doing stuff like that. But there are people out there who are still looking to connect in different kinds of ways. And I love what Curtis said about the social media. But Curtis, I will say this to you. I'm, I'm like an older person. I have, I have a LinkedIn. I have no Facebook. Um, I don't, I think I have an Instagram. I don't remember the password to it. You know, I'm the person who still actually has a landline. And so when I come home in the afternoon, my cell phone is in my purse. I don't even look at it or answer it. I am like, if you want to call me, you want to, you know, call me on my telephone. I still go to my mail slot every day and I'm excited to get mail, even the circulars from Ollie's you know, in, in Costco. So, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So we, you know, we need to really think about who our volunteer base is, why people volunteer, what motivates them, but then also how to reach them, okay? So um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. 
Oh, I just want to add two. And 15% of people connect to your organization and volunteer because they connect through a relative or a friend. So I found this slide and I, and I, I put this slide in because just as we were talking a little while ago, you know, when you are a different age, you think about things differently. Like I just said, I'm, I'm a baby boomer. I like going to my mail slot every day. I look at my messages on my landline phone, which I will never give up, you know? Um, and so you have to think about as you're looking for people to volunteer, as you're looking to think about who even become your donors, you know, how do you respond and reach out to those folks? And, but you have to know who that, those folks are. And we're gonna talk a little bit around data in a little bit, but this is some just in interesting data. So did you know that baby boomers have a 26% volunteer rate? And I, this was surprised me, is that nearly three out of four millennials ages 25 to 34 actually donated um, during the pandemic. 64% um, of all Americans have made some type of donation since the start of the pandemic. That's a lot of people who realized that there was a real need in their communities and they made donations. Um, and then going back to um, what, and I have the list here, so I'm flipping back and forth between my papers, um, what Jacqueline was saying earlier about that social connection, um, the Journal of Happiness study says that one third of Americans, once again, are, exp are experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression, but that volunteerism actually boosts mental health. And that's because, you know, it's about connecting with people. And so I want you guys to all think about that. Um, you know, while you're thinking about volunteerism in terms of, you know, how does this help the agency? Also think about how volunteerism for your agency helps the actual volunteers that come into your organization, okay? Um, because, and, and that's gonna, um, and kind of put this in your, in your parking lot because that's gonna kind of drive how you develop content and reach out to folks um, um, as you want to bring them in as volunteers. And remember this too, because this is really important. Most volunteers also donate to the organizations that they volunteer for. And most people who become donors to organizations come through, do so because they're connected with somebody who is connected to your agency, either as staff or volunteer. Okay, Ms. Emily, can we go to the next slide? So what should we be doing now? Um, I just, I know some of you don't have the, the chat, the hand function, but you can use an emotion emoji. I would love to know how many of you during the pandemic actually created a volunteer management program. And Emily, I don't know if you can um, help me see some of that. Cause I can't, let me see if I can come on speaker view for a second. Nope, I can't. I don't know what I'm doing. So. How many do we, can Emily can tell me how many raise hands that we have? Or emoji signs that tell us um, how many folks have created a volunteer program or so this is Naisha Gibbs from Duchess Outreach. I don't know if you could see my hand raised, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I work at Duchess Outreach as the manager of volunteers. And um, I did not uh, type up a, a plan, but it was a mental plan that we had to immediately adjust to at the start of COVID. So we had to really address the needs that we, um, that we had here, we were providing meals in our lunchbox, as well as still operating our food pantry, and we did not shut down. So in order to kind of remain safe as volunteers, as a lot of volunteers started to pull out at that time, we were able to say, well, hey, we only need a few volunteers because we wanted to be safe, um, keep not only our volunteers safe, but our employees safe. So we realized that we had to assess the program, figure out how many volunteers we needed, and only keep those volunteers that were willing to, to stay, stay with us. Um, and it was amazing to see how many people stayed committed throughout COVID uh, with us. And again, to your point of volunteers um, being there, not only to assist us, but also for them. Um, and they just kept 
plugging along um, and we just kept reassuring them that we were keeping all each, each other safe. And the volunteers have just been incredible. And what surprised me the most about all of this is the number of people that remained with us and the number of people, although we are not accepting volunteers right now, but there are a large number of people that are still looking to volunteer with us. So I would, if there are people who are looking to volunteer um, with you guys and you can't use them right now, one of the things I want you guys to think about um, is, I'm a, is to think about maybe how those volunteers can be shared with others. I mean, if you can't use them right now and they really wanna get involved, you know, then connect with the folks who are sitting in this room right now. And maybe in Melissa and Emily, I don't know if you guys are gonna create um, a, a contact list for all the presenters who are on. Um, but I, listen, I am a firm believer in abundance. I, I'm never one of these folks who think that there's not enough. And I, I always believe if, you're, if your hands are open to give, your hands are open to receive. And so if you have folks who are calling you and coming through your doors and saying, you know, we wanna do something and you can't utilize them right now, then send them to your colleagues, you know? That way the folks are being connected and they're staying busy. And let me tell you something, you are actually building goodwill for yourself as an organization. You're building goodwill in your communities with the volunteers and you're building goodwill with your, your colleagues because you know what, at this point, we are all in this freaking COVID pandemic, Kofefe or Kofefe together. So, you know, and so we might as well leverage it and make the best use of it. Um, and so if you see me looking down, it's because Melissa had the, thank you, Melissa, um, sent me a list of all the people who enrolled today. So I'm actually looking at your names and your agencies and making notes on that so as well. Um, so one of the other things that folks know about me when I do these presentations is I am a big, I am a big data person. Um, because data actually be helps you become adaptive and agile. And so I also think to myself, um, I'm sorry, Emily, can we go to the next slide? Um, so nope, go back to the, the, the previous one. Yes, so um, I don't know, nope, one more. This one, yeah. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jim Collins from Good to Great. Um, but he is one of my, he is my all time favorite business author. And I have read that book probably five or six times over the last 20 years. Um, and he actually did a little monograph specifically for nonprofits. Um, if you have not read that, um, I also do executive coaching and the two books I always refer to my, my, the folks that I coach are From Good to Great by Jim Collins and Ben Horowitz, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, and, 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 and both of those books really talk about some, like the decision-making process and what drives that. Um, and I believe that you make decisions from your gut, but I also believe you make decisions with data because I think your gut kind of frames the numbers because numbers are just numbers, but your gut helps you kind of figure out like in what context that data should be used. And so I don't know how many of you are um, using this time right now, but have you been surveying your, your volunteers? Um, have you talked to them about like how they're doing through the pandemic? Um, how was, even before the pandemic, you know, how was your experience with us? Um, do you feel like this, like your, your skills and your talents were useful? What skills and talents do you have? Um, you know, and this is where you really should be thinking about um, like an onboarding process if you don't have one, an onboarding and orientation process for volunteers because people volunteer and their time is precious. And so they don't wanna come and, and when they get there, they're like, oh, okay. And you're sitting at the desk, no one greets them. No one has anything prepared for them to do. That's how you lose volunteers. And, and you also always, always, always wanna do exit interviews with volunteers. And sometimes volunteers don't leave because it was a bad experience. You know, often volunteers leave because their life situation changes. Um, you know, our lives are all cyclical. There are times when we have more time than others. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're capturing that information from your volunteers um, so you can improve the overall volunteer experience for folks who are coming through your doors. It actually also improves your management systems. How are you tracking people? Um, how are you making sure those resources are aligned? How are you making sure that you have enough 
um, money in your budget for PPE and other resources that your volunteers may need. Data actually have, um, helps drive those decisions, okay? It understands and helps you measure your impact. So for those of you who are grant writers and development people, you know, if you need to do in-kind on a grant application, what's the best thing you can do? You can count those volunteer hours, which the last time I count, I think it was, um, I think it was like up to $27 per hour is what the, is the average um, rate for volunteer hours. That's information that should be used in your grant applications. And even as you're just sharing your impact in the community um, with your, within, with your board and with the community, you know, we had, you know, 100 volunteers donate, you know, 7,892 hours to these programs in our community. That's good messaging. And we're going to talk about content later. So I'm going to stop here and say this, as I'm trying to also look at the chat. Um, I get so excited about this stuff that I start, I'm like, I look at my presentation, and I'm like, I know I've already like moved four slides. And so when you, when we go through the slides, you'll see, oh, she just already talked about that because this stuff is also interconnected. And so I'm, I'm kind of like already someplace else, but I'm back here with you guys. So if I'm moving too fast, somebody can just raise their hand or somebody can, I used to, when, I'm, when I do live presentations, I tell people to do this to me because I get so excited to tell me like the slow down. <laughs> so don't be afraid to, to, to do that. Um, and then, you know, the data actually helps you with your recruitment and retention. And once again, if you can share with people in your community and with your colleagues and with your board about the things that you are doing, those are actually good messaging tools for recruitment of new volunteers. And people like to feel like they're making impact. So that actually helps retain people too. So you need to be sharing that information with people about their experiences, not just internally, but also externally as well. So I see crazy cat lady says she's scared to volunteer right now because of COVID. Yes, they're high here in um, Syracuse, New York. And yes, there are some online opportunities. I think New York State um, has um, a volunteer portal. Um, I'm sure that United Way and the 211 also have um, information about volunteering. And, and what I'm going to say to you, crazy cat lady, and you know, you and I can probably be really good friends. So um, is that you know, you, you just need to figure out and connect and think about what does that look like to, be, to you. So before you reach out to these places, be very clear about how much time you have to, to volunteer and what kind of things that you like to do so you can narrow your search um, and you can actually help the organization that you connect with, help them build a really good volunteer experience for you because, you know, you, you've kind of identified what the, the, does that look like for you. Now, does it mean that you're not open? because somebody might say something to you and you'd be like, oh, I didn't think about that. So also be open to new ideas. Okay, Emily, we're gonna go to the next slide. Any questions? I'm looking at the chat. Oh, thank you, Peter. So, I haven't seen too many questions, but just so many great ideas. Thanks everyone. Oh, yes. And we, we get, I hope I get copies of the chat later. I, I do wanna go back. To, you don't have to move this slide, Emily, but I do wanna say something about the, the data real quick. Um, so, Data provides you with actionable insights. It identifies issues and opportunities. Once again, it helps you manage your resources. Um, so I just want you guys to think about that when you're looking at the data and what kind of the data you could collect. Um, and so for those of you who are, haven't really been doing this, this might also be a great volunteer opportunity for someone to come in and actually create some surveys and stuff for you, some of the college students or other folks who may have retired um, and who are looking for something to do. So it might be another volunteer path for you as well. So we're gonna go to the next slide, connecting with others. So 88% of all searches are done on Google. So we don't even say, oh, did you search the internet? We just say, hey, did you Google it, right? Like Google is so in our lexicon right now, um, which is why they're probably trying to break them up as a monopoly, but whatever. Um, so I would encourage all of you to think about if you haven't set up your little, um, like, so if you put in, um, you know, United Way of, um, if you put in United with Dutchess County, um, what comes up? And so before you, um, you don't, I mean, and you don't actually use the real search name, but if you just put in United Way, and it, so, you know, the Google search will come up. 
usually on the side of that is like a little thing that talks about the business. So we'll say website, um, directions, and contact, right? If, you, if your agency hasn't done that, create your Google business page because people go to that. That's where people, you know, leave reviews. That's where people leave other kind of information. And you can see like who's coming to your website. And it's, a, it's another great tool and um, to collect data about your organization. So, um, you know, you, you wanna use your, your current volunteers to, you know, connect with your current clients, volunteers and other key, key stakeholders. So, you know, are you using your volunteers to reach out to your clients, making phone calls, um, sending emails, sending handwritten notes? Um, I belong to a group here in upstate New York called Women of Pearls. Um, and one of the things that we did many, many years ago is that we would go into the nursing homes on Valentine's Day. Um, and now we just have been talking about what does that look like for us? Um, and we're not even sure if we can even take cards over, right? So we've been working with our you know, nursing home right in our community, one of the ones in our community um, to ask them like, so how can we help you guys around volunteer day, you know, around volunteering around um, Valentine's Day, you know, to connect with residents? Can we, if we do the cards two weeks early and you keep them in a plastic bag, you know, will that kill if there's any potential coronavirus on them? Um, I'm on the public library board here. And what we decided to do is not spray all of our books, but if someone returns a book, we just, we, it falls into a plastic bag at the end of the day, we tie that plastic bag up. And we know if it sits in that, that plastic bag for two weeks or something, it's supposed to kill the virus. And that means we don't have to, you know, damage the books by spraying any disinfectant on them. Um, oh, Melissa says we're having a letter writing party next week, right? You know, I mean, one of the things that we other the, one of the other things that we do is we have created a love your legislator day and so we used to have our legislators come in for coffee and stuff well we can't do that so we're going to send them like virtual coffee you know we're sending them little, we're sending them like little bag we're sending a virtual coffee day and we're sending them like little bags of coffee beans you know to our legislators um for love our le legislators it's because we can't have them come in right now so um the other thing is too um I'm thinking, and I haven't, we, I haven't heard this and maybe somebody is doing it, but we've been thinking about maybe recording some audios for people and then just sharing them online on our Facebook or our website. So people can just kind of click into that. And we don't know what the, what the audios will say yet, but I mean, that's just, I think it's an interesting way to connect with folks. Um, and so those of you who work with small children, um, maybe you want to read stories and then um, if you, I think I, I saw the Child Care Council on here. Yep, I saw, I don't know if Jen Brown is on the um, call, um, but maybe have some of your volunteers um, record them reading stories um, to children that you can put on your website. So daycare centers um, and other people can like click into those and hear that at night, right? Because um, we have a lot of parents who are on the Zoom. Um, or a lot of parents who are still, especially some of your our, our low income folks are still working jobs. They don't have the luxury of not working. And so maybe, you know, the children having access to that um, not paid, non-paid content is helpful. Um, you might also want to have your, your volunteers create content. So as Curtis was saying, social media is a great way to connect with people. I'm not on social media, really. I don't know how to really create content, except for what I do with you guys when I'm in person, you know, but if you have some great writers who are volunteers, you know, when's the last time you refreshed your, your website or any of your other content? Um, so you can have your volunteers do that. Um, I did a presentation for some arts organizations down in New York City a few months ago. And I love that a lot of them were doing online um, shows. So, you know, for you guys who, even if you're not an arts organization, right? Maybe your, um, your staff and your volunteers might want to do an online comedy show or an online art exhibit, stuff like that. I mean, there's a way to get people involved. And I would say this, maybe you have some volunteer podcasters, absolutely. Um, and I would say that if you don't have that expertise in your staff, you know, if you do the survey with your volunteers, you can see what kind of expertise, skills, and talent that those folks are bringing to you. And really, at this point, 
because we're virtual, you, you guys are no more lim you're no longer limited by geographic location. So really the, in some ways, the benefit for, of COVID for us is that now the world is our oyster and we can reach audiences that we've never reached before. So for those of you who are in those kind of um, organizations where you're doing arts and culture, you know, where you were limited by your, you know, your 200 seat theater, now you can do an online um, show or reading, and now you can open that up to the world. Um, my, my women's group recently just did a, we did a four day vision board workshop weekend. And on our third day, we had um, a licensed clinical social worker come in and the title of her, her topic was um, self-care in a time of COVID. We had people as far away as Mexico City you know, who had come in on this call to, to talk about how do you self-care during COVID. So don't limit your thinking, right? Just think about how you can reach out to all these folks in very different ways. So again, you wanna, you know, you wanna use multiple channels to connect with people. Um, and this is what I'll say to you, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more later on, but for those of you who are board members um, on this call, um, I want to really encourage you guys to really think about, you know, how are you connecting with your staff right now? Um, I am a big proponent of board members should not just show up for a two hour meeting once a month and then nobody sees you in the interim. You know, we are all kind of walking through this and I think it behooves board members to really reach out um, not only to the executive director, but to the staff and say, how are you doing? How are our volunteers doing? How can we help you? And likewise, I think the, um, it's a good time for staff to say to the board members, we thank you for your volunteerism because board members are volunteers and those are relationships that also need to be um, nurtured. So any, anything I need to pay attention to in the chat, I'm gonna, I, I don't wanna scare you, but I have two cups here because I have one is coffee and one is um, daytime cold medicine. So anything in the chat that I need to pay attention to or a question I need to answer because I know I'm moving kind of fast here. So, oh, I, so um, good. just more great ideas. <laughs> so I see a couple of hands up, but I don't know if I don't know um, if these were hands up from before. So I see Bonnie has their hand up. Um, Naisha, did you put your hand down or is it still up? My hand is down. I spoke already. Thank you. Okay. Is Bonnie? I see Bonnie's hand is up. Bonnie, do you want to unmute yourself and make a comment, question, or say something? One of the things that um, we've done is um, to try and ease the minds. You're right. We had to survey everyone to find out where they were and what level of comfort they had by being actually on site. We are a community meals program mm -hmm. and we've switched from dining room service to um, meal grab and goes in the courtyard. And so um, some people were not really comfortable interacting with the volunteers the way they would have indoors before COVID. And by surveying them, we definitely found the comfort level and we're able to assign them to a shift that was good for them. So yes, um, I think you're absolutely right. And um, it's very important to know where your volunteers are at. Absolutely, absolutely. Because once again, and it goes back to that previous slide about you know creating a good experience for them. I mean, you know, the, the most valuable thing that we have is our time. And I think if nothing else, um, as I have lost seven family members, not all to COVID, um, but I, I lost my nephew in a motorcycle accident back in April down in the Baltimore area. And then not being able to you know, go to his service, um, not being able to connect with my family in a way where you know, we were able to grieve. And, I, and as I get older, I'm realizing that I cry a lot. So if I just start crying in the presentation, just ignore me because I'm just a crazy old cat lady who cries. Um, but you know, we're grieving so much um, about what our lives used to be like. And so I think it's really important as we connect with people, we, we understand that and we respect that. Um, 
And I don't want people to ever say, oh, when we get back to normal, because I don't think we're ever will get back to normal in a way that we have before. And that's not even just because of the pandemic. Um, and I'm going to diverse 30 seconds here and I'm not going to get political, but what we, when we watch what happened um, on our Capitol, at our Capitol on January 6th, what I saw was a lot of people who were trying to figure out how to get their voices heard in a way that they think that they have not been heard. Uh, and I'm not making a judgment call about that in terms of whether I think your philosophies, philosophies are right or wrong. Um, but I, I will say um, violence and that stuff is kind of never the answer. But we live in a country right now where we have some, we have a lot of healing to do, um, both economically. When you have folks who've made a gazillion dollars during the pandemic and other folks have lost money. Um, racially, we saw a lot of the, the, the racial um, justice stuff bubble up again in this country, which has been bubbling up for years. Um, so we have the social economic, we have this racial stuff, we have this pandemic, we saw health disparities. So we are called to do this work right now. And we need to all put our hands to this work. And I think volunteerism is a way that we can make sure that we structure these experiences of folks who really are about making change in, in their communities. And so how as organizations can you help them do that? And thank you, you know, crazy cat lady, I want you to send me your phone number because you and I need to talk afterwards because you're right. Crying cleanses the soul. <laughs> so, um, Emily, I'm gonna let you take me to the next slide. So identifying the need, this, and this goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning um, with the information that Lenny was sharing with you. Um, what, what in your community, what in your organization has changed since the pandemic? You know, are you still serving the same population? You know, is it still the same? Are you still serving people in, in a similar location? Um, do you still need to offer the same services? And that also ties back to the data slide. You know, when is the last time you really had an opportunity to look at this stuff? Um, and I think in some ways, and I said this at the presentation that I did for you guys last spring, um, in some ways the pandemic has kind of made us kind of slow down. And I'm hoping that we're all kind of taking this time to think about um, like what happens in our organizations now. You know, is our mission still relevant to the things that we've been doing? Or how do, how do we need to make these pivots or make these changes, right? Um, and so you want to use the data to kind of figure that out. And that's also the data is also talking to each other as you kind of look at the needs in your community and the things that are, are, are going on. So I'm looking to make sure there's any uh, questions or comments. So like, so for one of the things that we realized um, as the, uh, as I'm on the board of the public library system here in Onondaga County, you know, our libraries closed, right? So, but people were at home more. So people wanted books. And if you're like me, I don't like to read books on my tablet. I don't, I don't like audible books. I like to, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of girl who likes to curl up in her big oversized chair with a cup of coffee or tea, you know, and hold a book. And so we decided that what we were going to do is that we were going to do curbside pick up and drop off for books. And so we had to expand that technology because our need changed. So I'm going to make a quick pivot to this. I don't know how many of you have strategic plans Throw out your three to five year strategic plans. Life is too crazy. Stuff is turning like this. I mean, for those of you who, who had to leave your offices and, and, and move quickly, did you, who could even remember who had the, the freaking Facebook login or where was a checkbook to, to write checks or pay bills? And how many of you moved to online payment systems like bill.com? Because like everything had to literally change like that. So if you have a three to five year plan, take it over the next couple, you know, months, weeks, whatever, look at it. What can you still use? What have you used? And then maybe take that to create like a 12 to 18 month work plan. So you think about, you know, if your agencies are closed right now, what will our agencies look like if, when we reopen? We'll be able to bring back the same number of staff people. You know, have we adjusted our budgets to include PPE? Um, 
what HR policies or other policies do we need to change and update um, because of this? I mean, now is the time to really look at that. And then, and of course you can't do everything at once, but kind of create then this schedule of like, okay, these are the things we need to do now. These are the things we need to do in the next couple of months. These are the things that need to happen when we open. Um, because we're constantly like changing this. And Curtis, I'm gonna, I'm saying this to you specifically, but to everybody else out there, don't worry about having a, an old computer because literally the technology changes like every three, four months, they do that deliberately to keep us buying all this stuff. So, you know, it's, it's no fault of yours. So don't even worry about it. But, you know, those are the kind of things that we have to think about. I mean, if we need to go into, um, you know, this more long-term, will we help our employees pay for their internet bills? Should, should we be doing that? I mean, these are all the kind of things that we need to be thinking about um, as we kind of move through this this period where we are right now. Will we offer some of that for our volunteers? Um, so these are, so you have to identify the need, you know, not only for your services for your clients, but also the services and needs for your volunteers and, you know, also, also your other internal stakeholders. Questions, comments? You guys are being awfully quiet out there. You're scaring me. You're Hi, probably all good asleep. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> This is Nikki Telesco Wimberly from Open Arms Transitional Housing in Wappinger Falls. Um, we've one of the things that I this I've been shouting out and telling everyone is that yes, it has changed how we operate as mm -hmm. in our population. Um, we're a home that takes in women and children in crisis and um, mothers. A lot of the shelters, unless you're domestic violence, do not take the mother and the child. They take the mother and then the child, Child Protective Services is called, and the children are removed from the parent. And so open arms, we try to, we, our goal and our motto has always been to keep the, the parent and the child together. So with that being said, a lot of our clients came from the hospitals, um, Vassar Brothers or wherever they delivered, if they did not have a place to live, we would receive a phone call from the social workers in these locations telling us that the client had, did not have a place to go upon discharge and did we have room. Um, CPS would say, come to us and say, you know, because they were seeing their clients regularly, they were getting visits in-house regularly. Um, they would say, well, our client has come up and, and lost their housing. Do you have some room? Because now a lot of these, the turnaround is so quick in the hospitals, social workers are not being available as much as they are in the hospitals. Um, in the social, even in Department of Social Services, they're not seeing their clients as quickly as they would normally, you know, the building would be full every day, all the time. So we would be at full max capacity um, and we were looking to expand because of that. Our uh -oh. waiting list. Right. Now, we know that they didn't just disappear. <laughs> These people didn't just go away, but our our connection to them has now been interrupted. And so we're finding um, some of our young ladies are living wherever they can in vehicles, um, trying to stay in the tr uh, Metro North train station unless they're moved, um, sitting in restaurants or as long as they can. This is, I don't, and I am not prepared for how to make that adjustment other than word of mouth. And it's devastating. It's devastating because we do have, oh, we do have room now and I am not getting the, the people in because we're not making the connections. So am I, Nakisha, am I pronouncing it correctly? So I hope you guys all heard Nakisha on this call. So for those of you who work with this population, you need to be connecting with her um, and making referrals to her. Um, I do see the crazy cat lady want to know where you're located. So if you could put that into the chat where you're located. Sure. Um, and, and, and this is why I, I, I love this because once again, the learning and the connection is in the room, right? So you guys have a chance yeah. to um, 
Melissa says, put your information in the chat. So we have these opportunities to make these connections because we just talked about connecting to each other. And while we're talking about this right now in the, in the framework of volunteer management, you know, this also applies once again to us sitting in this room right now. How do we connect each other? We have, we have resources, we have services that we can share with one another to help make our jobs easier. So let's make sure that we are, we're doing that. Um, I would also say to you, Nakisha, this is also a good time for you to, to press into your board um, yes. and see what kind of connections your board has to kind of get that information out. Um, okay. And maybe you want to do some kind of Facebook live post about the needs you're seeing with the, with the folks that you're serving. You might want to um, connect with some of the businesses who, you know, businesses still are trying, I think, to find a way to have their um, volunteers, their, their staff connect during like community service days and while they may not be able to come out anymore, maybe they can do a, a blanket or a mitten drive for you or something like that where they can drop things off to you. So, so this is where you can sit down with your board and be creative. So I'm gonna make another quick pivot um, because we're not talking about board development per se. But one of the things I've been saying is I've been doing this a lot of board work over the past couple of months is I say to people, are your board acting in a strategic, a prudent, and I can't remember my, my third one right now, but I've been telling people almost kind of think about your board as two sides of a whole. So on your board, which are those board members who can really work with the organization on kind of stabilizing where they are right now, right? And so how do we just continue to maintain our daily operations, make sure our staff get paid, you know, around, you know apply for this next round of PPP, you know, continue to be thought partners and supports for the staff, um, in this organization. But I think the other part of your board should be, as we continue to move through where we are right now, what are, what's that strategic mode that we need to think about where we have to get to? So I think the other part of your board should be doing that work. So once again, if we can fully reopen our doors um, in six, 12 months, whatever, what will that look like? Um, will we have access to the same funding? Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of foundations have a lot of foundations have pivoted to some like a lot of emergency funding. You know, will they go back to funding the things that they used to fund? So maybe some of your board members can start to be reaching out to their funders and saying, "Hey, just want to touch base with you quickly." To, you know, um, so you know we have this pot of money from you now. You've been funding us for several years. What does that look like in the what future? Can you give like us any idea? idea? Oh, I got a little echo. Um, so. I want organizations to start thinking strategically, and that's also about your volunteers, right? Um, how will you use them in the future because you can't really use them right now? So um, I think Anne Marie, Anna Marie had her hand up, but she had unmuted herself. So I don't know if you had a question. Nakisha, I'm gonna actually um, lower your hand. I'm sorry, I did it by accident. I was typing oh, okay. in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Vani, did you have another question or should I lower your hand? Okay, I'm gonna lower hand. Um, anybody, oh, Vani, did you have a question or a comment? No, no, okay. I didn't, sorry. Okay, okay. All right, I'm looking at chat, thank you. So let's go to the next slide, Emily, thank you. You know, so this, this goes back to the whole, the data piece, um, you know, improving the, the, the um, volunteer experience. There have been so many great platforms right now where people are offering free training. I don't know how many of you have heard that New York State um, has, New York State Department of Labor has collaborated with Coursera. So you can actually get a free Coursera account and actually take access to classes. And I think if you go to the New York State Department of Labor, you can make that connection. Um, for folks, and that might even be a great resource for maybe some of your staff if you, you've had to lay off. Um, and of course, you know, you don't get like a certificate like you're going through an actual, an actual program that you matriculate in, but Coursera has great classes on there. I've taken a couple of them and I've learned so much. Um, Udemy is another platform. edX.org is another platform, you know. So what you want to do is you're, is you're thinking about your volunteers and, you, and because you've done this, this survey, this kind of assessment, um, and not just with your volunteers, but also with your staff. So as you're moving forward, 
through this, what kind of skills will your volunteers need to have? And then how can you help them get access to that? So, you know, so for instance, you might have somebody who is, they're pretty good at writing content because they used to maybe work in an, an ad agency. Um, they haven't done that in a while and, um, or a newspaper. So they're used to writing very long content, but they just need a little help adapting to writing, sh writing shorter content for social media. Udemy has some really great um, classes on social media marketing and everything like that. I put my son through one of those. He helps me. Well, let me take that back. He doesn't really help me because I can never get him to do what I want him to do when I want him to do it. But that's another conversation offline about, you know, the children that we love so much. Um, but, you know, but those are those opportunities that we can provide, you know, for our staff and our volunteers to, to think about that. Um, this is a great time if you haven't had a chance um, to ask your board members who are business people, um, hey, you know, hey, so-and-so, you know, Joe Smith, who is the president of the bank, um, do you guys have any, um, you know, training um, and PD coming up for your staff? You know, is it possible for us to get one or two slots for our staff and our volunteers? You want to make sure that people are getting access to that kind of thing. And those are the kind of things that you want to ask your board members and others to help you with. Because what you think you really want to do is you want to, you know, build the capacity of the agency, but you also want to build the skill competencies of your volunteers and your staff. Um, and I'm a big proponent of Excel. Excel. People think they have to go out and buy these really expensive um, data management programs. You would be amazed at all that you can do with an Excel spreadsheet. So if you don't have anybody proficient in Excel, please, please, please get somebody who's proficient in Excel, because as you're collecting all this data, somebody who's proficient in Excel can quickly um, group that, that information together and analyze it and provide you with some really good usable data. Okay. And I'll make sure you guys get all this information about Udemy and Coursera and stuff on the, um, on the, uh, in the presentation when I send it out. Can we go to the next slide, Emily? So, what are the things in your organization that need attention right now? Can you do somebody to help you with writing or filing and organizing, um, designing websites and that kind of thing? I mean, those are some kind of quick and dirty things that you can get people to do. Um, and I'm just gonna jump here because I actually have another that stuff, but I'm just gonna talk about it now. Um, you know, you guys have also heard of micro volunteerism, right? A lot of people say they don't volunteer because they don't have time and they don't wanna make a long-term commitment. Make sure that when you're providing your job, you're, you're, you're outlining your volunteer opportunities, that you have opportunities that you know only require an hour or two. And make sure you're very clear about that when you're describing that for folks. Because somebody's like, I just wanna come in and build a bookshelf. I wanna come in and, and repaint the community room when nobody is there. That's gonna take me a Saturday morning. I'm willing to volunteer to do that. I don't really wanna do anything long-term. You know, so you have to make sure that you, you know, you as an organization have a clear um, ideal of the things that you need as an agency, and then being able to translate that into um, information that you can put out on your networks about these are the kind of volunteers that we're looking for. This is the time commitment with a brief description of what it is. People want to know what they're signing up for. And so for it to be kind of vague um, and you not be able to provide people details, that will run people away. Any questions on the busy work? Okay. I'm almost to the end. Yay! I've been talking for a long time. Um, let's go to the, um, oh, this is the last slide. So, and we've talked about a lot of this already. So once again, remember that your, your board members are volunteers um, and that you really want to engage them around this time. Um, I, I do a lot of board development, governance, and strategic planning work. And the one, the one thing I hear from all the time is my board is not engaged. So this is where I'm getting ready to have this really hard conversation with you. And if it doesn't apply, be like, well, that doesn't apply to us. A lot of time, organizations, EDs, will choose their friends to be on the board. Or they will choose people because this person is very well known in the community um, and it would be great for this person to be on our board. Why in the heck would you choose somebody to be on your board 
who already sits on seven other boards in your community. They don't, they're not gonna have time for you. They're, they're just not. And so I hear this complaint, well, they're not engaged. Well, you pick somebody who doesn't have time to be engaged with you, right? So I don't know if the United Way or one of the foundation has a program like this, um, but in, up here in upstate New York, I worked with the Gifford Foundation and we started a program called NPL, Nourishing Tomorrow's Leaders. And what we really did was like, we helped, we identified people who don't normally get offers to be on a board because they're not the VP of the local utility company or they're not the president of the bank. But these other folks bring other skills and talents to a board, more so than just writing checks. Money is important and you need board members who can give you access to funding resources, but you also need board members who can help you think about how do you restructure your programs and your services to best serve the people. And so you wanna bring in people who have a, you know, different degrees of thought. And so when I talk about diversifying a board, I'm not just talking about race and ethnicity. I think that that's the, that's the quick and easy way of looking at something. And if we have one black person, one Latino, one Asian American, oh, we've done something, okay, that's fine. But I'm talking about in terms of social economic, I'm talking about in terms of race, I'm talking about in terms of various abilities, you know, you want to find people who will give you different viewpoints about how you do the work that you do. And you wanna pick people to be on the board who actually have time to devote to your board. I, I am a strong proponent in, as a board member, sometimes I just, I just show up at a public library. I just walk through when I, I could do that. And just, just see, you know, I went into my, my, uh, our main branch one time, there were a bunch of kids sitting there playing um, Nintendo. I, I have four boys. I grew up playing video games. I just jumped right in and started playing Nintendo with them. They didn't need to know I was a board member. I didn't want them to know I was a board member. I just wanted to just hear their conversation and see what they liked about the about our system, the kind of things that they were doing there, you know, why, you know, how often they came. And that's that kind of informal information that you get as a board member from someone who's connected and involved and really has time for your organization to do that. And so those are the folks that you want to pick. You want people who are going to really be volunteers for your organization. Um, remember that volunteers become potential donors, right? Um, people like to give money to places that they're already connected to. So, you know, when you're doing your surveys um, and you're asking your, your, your volunteers like about the things that they do, ask them about the other groups that they're connected with. Ask them about um, what they would like to do um, because you want to be able to connect with that. Because, and so when we get into recruitment, where to look, you should be starting immediately right around your current volunteer base. You know, I hear a lot about, you know, we, we want to diversify in terms of race and ethnicity. Okay, well, so, you know, if I'm the one black board member or if I'm the one Latino board member, I don't want to come in the room and be the only one and I haven't had an onboarding experience. Um, I don't know who else is in the room. No one welcomed me. I, that's not a good place. I'm not, I'm, most, I'm not gonna most certainly tell my friends, come be on this board with me, or you should think about um, volunteering with this organization because my experience is not good, right? People talk about what feels right for them, right? So my women's group is called Women of Pearls. I sometimes wear my t-shirt to the grocery store. Even I even We even have a mask with our little logo on it. People at, will ask me, well, what is that? So, and you guys have heard me who've been with me before have heard me also say this. If you don't have an elevator speech for everyone in your organization, everyone on down from the custodian or the maintenance person up to your, your board president, people should be able to describe what your organization does. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think it's called 29, 29, 11, 27, 11, 9. You, you have 27 words. You have 20, 27 seconds, 11 words to describe three points or something like that. And I, I'm, I'll make sure I get it out to Melissa. Um, but everybody should be able to talk about your organization and what they do in a very concise and clear way. So if nothing else, if the, 
I'm going to ask you guys to do. If you don't have that little elevator speech um, for everybody, one of the first things you should do when you get off this, this, this website, this webinar today, is have somebody help you guys create that. Because if people are looking for things to do and looking for ways to get involved, and someone comes in and they see your, your T-shirt or your logo on something, you know, I heard somebody ask about, you know, putting their logo on the on the um, 211 website. Okay, so somebody calls you and they say, yeah, I saw your, your logo on the 211 website. Tell me what you do. And then the person who answers the phone can't describe very quickly what that looks like. You're gonna lose that person. If you go to your website and people look and, and, and your mission is right, right there with a couple bulleted points about what you do, People are going to click right away, and and for those of you who coll who who collect your your analytics around people coming to your website, look at how long people are seeing on your website. Look at what they're looking on your website. Look at how long people take to click between you know your different pages, or if they're just clicking totally away, right? That's all information you can use. That means you're losing people, right? And your content wants to be engaging. You want people to be able to look at it and get through it clearly. Now, I'm, I'm an older person. I actually stop and read stuff. I still hold my books. I still have my landline phone, right? You know, these folks are looking, and I'm sorry, and is your stuff mobile? Mobile, um, okay, one of you young folks, what is that, mobile? You know, when you can look at it on your phone. What is that? You know, so you can look at it on your- Optimized. Thank you, because see, I did not know that, kind of. <laughs> I'm not a you young know, person though. Oh, well, thank you, Bob. I'm glad you're, you're up to date on all this stuff. You know, so yeah, your stuff looks really great on the website. You have somebody design a really great website for you and that kind of thing. But, you know, if somebody's looking at it on their phone or on their tablet, how does it translate? Does it look good on that way? So I know, for instance, for those of you who like use SurveyMonkey, SurveyMonkey, you can actually create it for both um, mobile app use or also for website use. So if you're looking at it on the phone, you can still continue to you know, go through a survey and you can still get the full page, full page. So these are the kind of things that you need to be thinking about as you're looking to recruit um, and retain volunteers because people are out there looking for opportunities, but you have to be able to connect with folks. And we've already talked about diversifying. So I'm going to do a quick Last few things, I think I've already talked about most of this. Um, going back to your board members, make sure you are outlining your expectations of what the agency needs from your board members. Use these folks as your thought partners. Don't be afraid to be transparent, not only with your, your board member, but your staff and your volunteers. Um, I think in, in light of where we are right now, people are looking for ways, people want to know you, they want to tr trust you, and then they're going to support you. Okay, and so I'm a big person on trust and transparency, acting with integrity, okay? Um, you wanna make sure you're engaging and communicating with people regularly um, in different kinds of ways. Make sure you have an onboarding program, not just for your volunteers, but also for your board members, which also are your volunteers. Um, if you haven't looked at it lately, look at your, your insurance policies. How are they covering your volunteers? Um, make sure that you're, you're accounting for your PPE and your safety stuff. Um, I update any policies that you have to do that. Um, if you are looking to for places to recruit, you know, um, are the schools still doing community projects? They want the students to do community projects. Um, so you're connecting with your local schools. I mean, if you need like a, um, a room painted, are you connecting with your local carpenters or painters union? Um, make sure that when you do have these job descriptions, once again, that you know you're very clear about um, what you're asking of people, but the time commitment. Um, and that description only needs to really be about a, a paragraph and thing like that. So I'm at the end of my presentation. You want to go to the last slide, Emily? So Desmond Tutu says, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. And so what I want to say to all of you is that as agencies in your community, you guys are all light in the darkness of this pandemic right now. Um, for the people um, that you serve. Um, and I know that your community is very appreciative of that. And so and that is all I have to say. So I can, I don't, Melissa, I don't know how much time I have. So I don't know if I, if I have time to take a couple of questions or if there's anything in the chat I need to pay attention to sure. anything I didn't answer because I went through everything kind of fast. 
Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that was phenomenal as always. I did have one question in the chat and then I'll see if there's time for one more. Um, one person asked what the best, most effective relationship is between an executive director and their board. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, so off the top of my head, I would say one that's built on mutual trust and respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes because people are, are transparent um, and they operate with integrity. Um, I, I am not one of this, these folks who believe that, okay, this is for the board members. The rest of you can listen in if you want to, but this is for the board folks who are on the, on the, on the, on the call. Your executive director should not be doing your board agendas. That is a function of the board. Um, I think uh, boards put too much work on, on, on uh, EDs and staff. Um, you're, you're, you know, you've made a commitment to be on the board and help um, provide the duty of care, duty of loyalty, and duty of obedience, which are your three fiduciary responsibilities as board members. Um, and so you, it, it, you need to, to take it upon yourselves to make sure that you understand what's going on your board what's going on in your organization. Um, that means you need, you're responsible for asking questions. You are uh, responsible for understanding the financials and really what this, this organization does and the services it provides. For board, for EDs, be transparent. Use your board members as thought partners. Don't hide things from them. Don't say, well, I'm gonna tell them about this and not tell them about that. Don't, don't do that. You know, if you really want to build trust with someone, you do that through transparency. Um, if there is not a good relationship between the board president or the board and the ED, then hire a consultant to come in. Because usually, and I had that slide in my last presentation, and, and Melissa, I'll make a note. You know, this always happens, Melissa. I say something, and then people are like, well, where is that slide? Because I didn't mean to, to say this. But I have a slide about... Um, when you're working with boards, usually what conflict arises from, and it usually arises from lack of information, lack of trust, fear, um, and communication. And so sometimes it's just about how do the board and the ED communicate with each other um, because they're not clear expectations and they're not really sure how to do that. And I always say to people, um, and I'm, this is not a shameless plug for consultants, but it is. Um, sometimes you guys just need help from someone outside of the situation to help you kind of navigate those relationships. And that's okay. And that's okay. And if you have dead weight on your board, if you have, you know, Bob Smith who hasn't shown up at a board meeting in the last six months and he hasn't been in, at all involved during pandemic, use your bylaws and says if you miss more than three meetings, get Bob off your board. Cause he's not helping you. You need people on your board who, who are gonna work. So that was a long way of me answering that question. I hope I did. So. Yes, absolutely. And that's because we as organizations don't set very clear expectations of what board members should be doing. And boards need to be getting ongoing professional development for boards. I suggest boards annually take an annual board assessment to kind of figure out how they're really um, operating and understanding their role. And they can use that information as a baseline and then they can build upon that. Um, as a support center, we use the ICAT um, assessment. Um, McKinsey used to have a really amazing free um, board assessment tool, but they no longer offer it. It was phenomenal and it was free. And you, you would send a link out to the board members and they would fill it out and come back and it was phenomenal. But um, right now we're using the ICAT. So I don't know if we have time for any last questions or I hope I answered that question. Perfect. Yes, that was, I think, really enlightening for everybody. Um, there's just tons of positive comments and feedback in the chat box for you because you're incredible. Uh, and you also had a board invitation if you'd like to join one of our. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have one final question they want to? Uh, I don't know who sent that invitation, but can I just tell you that sounds like a four letter word for me W O R K. I'm just. <laughs> Yeah, Beth, this is Jeannie. Thank you so much. You're a wealth of knowledge, and this was so informative, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys can just put questions in the chat. You know, Melissa knows how to reach out to me. 
Um, and I, I just, just want to say thank you to you guys for all the work that you're doing in your organizations. Hang in there. We are going to get through this one way or the other. I'm not sure how yet, but I know that if we stay connected, true to our mission, we continue to love upon each other, we will get through this. Thank you, Bevette. Uh, as Jeannie said, you're just incredible. Um, we love having you and hope to have you again soon. Thank you so much. And we have lots of requests too for your contact, if you wouldn't mind throwing that in. Um, and I'm going to give you all six minutes uh, till 1140 and we'll go move on to our next presentation. Thanks everyone for sticking with us. Go refresh oh. up, grab a granola bar or what have you. And thank you again, Bevette. You're wonderful. <laughs>